Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome teachers, students, and many EF staffers. We are so glad you've decided to join us virtually for this exciting event today in celebration of Veterans Day with our very special esteemed guest, Captain Steve Shepard, who goes by Shep. My name is Darby Jones, and I oversee educational partnerships for EF Explore America, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Shabin, who organizes events for teachers around the country. Sarah will be co-moderating this event with me today as we hear Shep's story. And so Shep, an enormous thank you to you for your service to this country and sharing your story with teachers and students far and wide. We are thrilled to be in an exclusive partnership with the Honor Flight Network that has afforded this opportunity, especially during this commemorative week and more specifically today being Veterans Day. Uh, today is truly a celebration to honor America's veterans for their patriotism, their love of country, and their willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. So Shep, we salute you. Quick reminder, although we can't see the rest of you, please type in any questions you might have into that Q&A feature during our time together. We would love to hear from you. And Sarah will be keeping an eye on that uh, as we save time at the end to go through some of those questions. So with that said, welcome Shep. We will turn this over to you to, to share your story. And if you don't mind, just starting at the beginning, that would be awesome. So before sure. we get into your incredible 31 year career in the military, please go ahead and share a bit about where you're from, your, your family, your upbringing, and perhaps what led you in the direction that you've taken. Um, Sarah and I will go off screen for just a little okay. while and then be back in, uh, in a few minutes. So ship over okay. to you. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are today. It's, a, it's an honor and privilege to talk to you and really to represent those who've worn the uniform. Uh, and I'm thankful I can tell you my story. Uh, I was born and raised in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, my father and was in the Army in World War II. My grandfather was in the Navy in World War I. And so that kind of helped create a military heritage. And I think what's important for all of you who are in the audience today is when you look back at American history, a, a lot of your family members have made it, where they've been in military or, or have done other things. Uh, I was born here. Uh, I, I grew up here and being in a Navy town, which is Norfolk, the world's largest naval base. Obviously, I was influenced by uh, seeing ships and, and airplanes and, and wanting to be a part of something bigger than myself. I think if I step back a little bit further, my father passed away when I was, was very young. And after school, I used to go to the MacArthur Memorial, which was a museum uh, dedicated to the life of General Douglas MacArthur. And I remember I'd go there every day after school and I'd walk through this museum. And it was just interesting to see the military history within that museum. And it kind of opened my world horizons. I kind of started thinking about, well, what do I want to do with my life? And it gave me an opportunity to, to see beyond what was around me and to imagine what, uh, what I could do. And I think all that constantly led uh, to the decision to join the military. So I, I joined the, the military uh, following college. I was in Naval ROTC. Uh, I got commissioned out of the University of Virginia. And uh, I started off as an intelligence officer. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the next uh, 31 years, but what is interesting is when you look at those 31 years, it's almost a reflection of what was going on in the world at the time. So I joined the Navy, uh, intelligence officer, so I was in charge of putting together intelligence for a, an aircraft squadron on an aircraft carrier. And at the time, an aircraft carrier had nine different squadrons. Some would be helicopters, some would be fighter jets, some would be bomber jets. Uh, and we would all were going out right after Desert Storm to go to the Middle East. And that was an interesting time uh, because back in the, when I entered the, uh, the Navy, uh, Saddam Hussein had, had invaded Kuwait. And uh, we as a nation had decided that we, we were going to respond to that. And we sent several aircraft carriers over to the Middle East region. There were actually upwards of six aircraft carriers in that region. And we were actually like seventh or eighth. Uh, we were on our way over when, when the war ended. But as, I, as we were over there, I started realizing that being in the Navy, that uh, you weren't just reading about history, you were actually part of it. And as I sat there uh, on our way over, I started thinking about, you know, what do I need to do uh, to give my best effort here? And I think when you find in the military that people are looking uh, to be a part of a team, a larger team. And uh, when we start to go into these difficult situations, uh, we're not looking for medals. We're, we're not looking for glory, but we're looking to do our job uh, and to do it well and to not let the team down. You know, uh, 
a few years before I joined the military, I was, I was playing high school sports. Now I was playing on the world stage. And I think that's going to be uh, the same for many of you as you decide to go into uh, the service or some sort of public service, uh, that your horizons are going to change as soon as you leave uh, high school and, and enter college or enter, or enter the workforce. It was right after that time, uh, after we got back from that deployment, uh, that I had an opportunity to go down to, to Panama. And I went down to Panama where we were doing counter uh, drug operations. At the time, South America was a, a major uh, shipment point for drugs coming out of uh, Colombia and other countries. And so I was part of a Navy aircraft squadron and it's something called an E-2 Hawkeye. It's a radar plane. You can, can take off and it can uh, pick up targets. And so we are picking up all the drug runners coming in from uh, Central America trying to get drugs into the U.S. And we were catching them and, and ideally preventing them from bringing those drugs into the United States. What was interesting at the time was the drug lords had had a, a big fight and they had eliminated uh, some of the competition. So all of a sudden, there was no drugs coming out of Central America because there was a gap in leadership. And I'll talk more about leadership later. But what ended up happening was, is that we spent a lot of time just manning the watch and just keeping our, our eyes on the area. But if we would step forward a little bit, um, that was big. You know, right around this time, the Soviet Union, which was the major world power against the U.S., had, had come apart. It was no longer the Soviet Union. It was the Russian Republic. And as a consequence, our Navy went from being uh, concerned about one major adversary to now looking at the world and looking at all the problems within the world, whether it be drugs, the problems in the Middle East, or et cetera, or elsewhere. So we kind of had a shift in what we were doing as, as a nation. Shortly after that tour, when I came back, uh, I was given a, a really unique opportunity uh, to work in the Defense Prisoner War Missing in Action Office. Now, at this time, it was some 20 years after the Vietnam War, but we still had almost 2,000 American service members who were missing. We didn't know where they were. Somehow during the war, they had, had either been shot down, uh, they had been lost in battle, or they'd been lost at sea, and we just didn't know where they were. So I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to go join that office, and then later go into Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and attempt to find them, and attempt to find out going on. But so what ended up happening is I'm going into those areas, um, I was starting to, to see a different world. You know, we're starting to see different people and different understandings. And I think I wanted to stress that. I think we as Americans tend to have our own understanding because of our experiences. But for us to be successful, we have to understand the world around us. We have to put ourselves in their shoes and that we're able to, to understand the cultures and the people that we're dealing with. And that time in Vietnam was, was fascinating. One, is a very beautiful country, but also working with the Vietnamese. And many of them were born after the war. So the presence of American going into the jungles and going into the country to try to find missing Americans was, was unique to them. And it gave an opportunity to, to meet Americans and understand them. Now, what else is unique about that job? I don't know if any of you guys like good mysteries. I, I know I do. It was like working a cold case. I'm trying to go back over 20 years and find out what has happened to these missing Americans. So we spent a lot of time uh, going back and doing files and information. And ultimately, we were able to find several of them. Uh, now, all of them had, had passed away, and we had no proof that any Americans were still being held against uh, their will, no evidence of any live prisoners. But it was important work for the families, because for the families, they were still waiting to find out what happened to their loved ones and to bring them home. It's probably one of the most important missions I've ever done uh, in order to, to take care of them. After that tour, I, I went to Japan on an aircraft carrier out of Japan, and uh, over there, uh, for a couple of years, and uh, that was another amazing opportunity to, to go see Asia. The thing that I think about though, is I was back home uh, on Christmas leave, I got a phone call. And the phone call was, you need to come back right away. And what had happened? Now, I talked about my friend Saddam Hussein earlier. Well, Saddam Hussein at this time, still in power, had decided not to let uh, the United Nations inspectors into some facilities in Iraq who thought were creating chemical weapons or, or nuclear weapons. And the consequence, I was back on a ship within two days and, and then at sea a day after that when we were back in the Gulf with four different aircraft carriers to include two British aircraft carriers. And what we were doing was is we were projecting national power. The president has instruments of national power. So that can be economic power. Uh, that can be diplomatic power. It can be military power. And well, we were the military power. And the president called us to go to, uh, to the Persian Gulf 
to force Saddam to open up these sites for inspection. Well, it worked. The sites were opened up and, and war was averted. And I can tell you, we, we, were, we were close and, and we were planning our missions. And that's the thing, you know, you get ready, you get out there and, and, and you think you're about to do something and you have to be ready to flex at a moment's notice. The, the military operations I participate in uh, to include combat operations, sometimes you know it's coming and sometimes you have just a few hours notice. And you always have to be ready. And that's why we train so hard uh, and, and so frequently because you want to be a reflex. For those of you who play football sports, you're always drilling, you're always practicing your moves. So you can be ready at a moment's notice to execute. You want to be a reflex. You don't want to have to think about it. Because in times of stress, you have to be ready to, to operate and to move quickly. So that's one to think that we always uh, stress in our training. That was a great tour. I came back uh, from, from Japan and then I was in Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and I was in Washington, D.C. the day of, of 9-11. Uh, I wasn't in the Pentagon that day, but I, I want to tell you something, you know. That was an amazing, amazing day. I was in the DC area and we, we got a phone call that a plane hit, had hit the World Trade Center. Now, for those of you who have studied this, at first we thought it was just a civilian airliner or a civilian plane had, had accidentally hit it. But I got a phone call a little while after that and they said, I think you might need to come in. Why, why, what's going on? Because I was in charge of the, of the, the Iran-Afghanistan team at, at at work at, at the Joint Warfare Analysis Center. And next thing I knew is like, the second plane has hit the tower. Okay, that, that is not a coincidence. They said, when we also noted a course correction, when the plane went in, it adjusted its flight profile so that it was obviously under control and it was a, it was a deliberate act. The DC was just, it was a crazy area. My, my future wife, uh, she was working for the federal government and she got a phone call to evacuate the building immediately because they thought the fourth plane, the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, was inbound to where she was. So they, they told people, take your heels off, start running, get out of the building. And uh, thankfully that plane, but she, that, when I'm driving around DC, I get another phone call. Uh, as I'm, I'm heading home because I'm uh, uh, to put my uniform on to go into work. And I was actually off that day. And I get a phone call, Pentagon's been hit, Pentagon's on fire. And then it was like, okay, now this how this is war, okay. And the question was, we've had three attacks, had them on the East Coast. Are we going to start to see future attacks? Are we going to see attacks on our forces in the Middle East? Are we going to see them uh, anywhere else in the United States? So it was an immediate shift of focus in in, in our, our need to rapidly identify what was going on. Uh, at, at that point, it, it seemed to to level out that afternoon and, and we just waited. I got out of my car at home and there were no jets above my house, which is unusual because I live near an airport. I do remember seeing two F-16s flying over and they were providing what we call CAP, Combat Air Patrol. And they were flying over us and flying over to Pentagon and flying to, to ensure the protection of our country. The thing I, I also remember that day as I was waiting at home to find out what was next, I looked out the window uh, at the end of the school day, it was around three o'clock, uh, 3.30, and I started seeing all these uniforms walking to the school, which was two blocks from my house. It was people who had come home from the Pentagon who had survived and were walking to tell their children that they were okay. As they walked down the street, I couldn't help but think about the price of freedom, of what these people were doing. It is unfortunate that uh, for some students, their, their parents, uh, did not come to meet them because their parents were uh, had been lost their lives in the attack, and and that was the tragedy of that day. And I think when I look back at 9/11, I also look back at 9/12. That 9/12 is when we were all united. There was no political fighting. We are all on the same team, and we are all working together because now we had we had a mission. And that's where I hope when we think about being an American that we think about 9/12. When we all came together, we worked together, we put our difference aside, but we came together as a team, as a family. Our national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one, well, we were one on that day. I was uh, told I was going to be going to Afghanistan with the first forces, got ready to go, made it to U.S. Central Command, Florida, and they said, we're not putting anyone in, in Afghanistan right now. You and several others are going to be part of the team here. So I was part of the planners uh, that planned the mission. And I think if we, the first thing we saw is, uh, you know, on the 7th of October, uh, the first airstrikes, uh, you know, we launched against uh, Afghanistan. 
you know, all I can help but do, I'm a, I think history is our guide. You know, we uh, we talk about honor flight, my uh, encounters with these veterans have seen living history. And all I could think about was back in 1942, a few months after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. launched a mission against Japan with the Doolittle Raiders. And uh, we had uh, 16 airplanes launched from, from the Hornet on April 18th, 1942, to strike back at Japan uh, to help start turning the tide of war. And uh, that night, uh, when uh, I was thinking about that, I, we, the mission was planned. All we had to do was wait for, it to, for the plane to take off. I remember just walking around my neighborhood uh, and just thinking uh, and, and saying a prayer for those air crews who were going in harm's way uh, that they'd be safe and that we'd accomplish, accomplish our mission. And I actually heard later, I uh, haven't been able to prove this, that three of the Doolittle Raiders went out to meet with those bomber crews before they took off from uh, Whitman Air Force Base, Missouri, to go all the way to Afghanistan and back, uh, just to encourage them and, and to, to be the legacy uh, that they were, they were performing. And then a little later, uh, around the, later in October, I think the 19th, we actually actually put U.S. forces in, in, into Kandahar, and that started the uh, the chain of events which led to uh, the fall of uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. So that was an exciting time. I can tell you from 9-11 to Christmas, it's a blur. I do not remember anything. I just, I just remember working every day. I remember just the constant uh, uh, battle rhythm where we were constantly in meetings, we were playing targets, we were supporting the ground forces and planning. It's just a blur. And then I, I remember Christmas. Uh, but at that time, a lot of people were going on play and it started a war which is just recently uh, wrapped up 20 years. That's a long time, folks. And those and, and our people went well. And more people volunteered for the military. They wanted to be a part of our country. They wanted to be a part of what was going on. They they had investment in our country, and they, this was something that they they went out to fight. So we, we should be thankful for our veterans who who served, whether it be for three years or 30, uh, to go and fight. Shortly uh, uh, after that um, that tour, I went off. Um, to Army Command General Staff College, did a war college tour. They like to do that in the military. They want they, it's always about training. Uh, you got to be a lifelong learner, and I encourage all of you to be lifelong learners. I was I, I was having training up to the day I retired after 31 years, because you have to keep up with events and circumstances and education in order to do your job, and, and not only to do it but to do it well uh, and, and help others. I then went to a, a place called the U.S. Pacific Fleet in Hawaii, and and that was an amazing tour. And I was there when we had a big tsunami uh, in, hit Indonesia where uh, there were uh, hundreds of deaths, uh, if not more. Um, and during that time, uh, the Navy was called to go help do tsunami relief in, in Indonesia. So we took an aircraft carrier, which, you know, has, again, I talked about these nine squadrons, and uh, there are fewer now, but at the time, went out there, and they're, they're an, an international power. They're ready to do war. Well, this ship became a ship for humanitarian relief efforts. Uh, we were making water uh, for the people of Indonesia. We were buying medical care. We were using a helicopter as the staging area for logistics. Uh, when I was out in Hawaii, uh, I was part of uh, something known as Operation Keiki Aloha. Keiki is the word for child in Hawaiian. Aloha means love, etc. We procured thousands of toys, stuffed animals, and other items for the children in Indonesia who had lost everything. And we state of Hawaii came together and the U.S. Navy took those, uh, uh, those gifts to those children over Hawaii, like Hot Wheels cars. We had thousands of Hot Wheel cars just to give those kids some hope, something to think about uh, would remove them out of that current situation. So what happens when you have a, a, a disaster relief? You got to figure out where the damage is. And once you know where damage is, is how do you get relief supplies to those people? So the Navy is looking at what roads still existed, which ones were washed out, what bridges still existed, where were the landing areas we could put helicopters? Where could we put the medical team? Where were the people congregating? Because you need to very uh, systematically figure out where you need to put your people and your resources to create the most effect. And obviously it, it, it's creating security uh, and, and help. And, and then also there were a lot of homeless people providing just basic needs and shelter. So the Navy with a lot of other countries uh, was part of that process. And that was probably one of the highlights is knowing that we were able take all this military power and do something good with it and, and make, uh, make the situation better and to help people in need because you would hope that they would do the same same for you. By my, my tour in Hawaii, I went to, to Europe at the US European Command. Uh, and that was another uh, amazing tour. I was there in Europe when two, two things happened of note. Uh, the, the first one is uh, 
Kosovo, a country declared independence. And it's a long story, which I could probably spend a couple hours on, but the bottom line is we got to see a, a country uh, evolve and, and, and become independent. Uh, it had been part of former Yugoslavia. And to watch this country grow and to go there and visit among the people, it, it was just, I think the, there's, a, there's a desire for freedom in each of us. There's a desire to be free, desire for your destiny, desire to be the best person you can be in any country, in any government. And to watch that happen in Kosovo was, was, was absolutely amazing. A little while later, there was uh, the invasion of Georgia. Okay, now, not our Georgia in the U.S., but Georgia over uh, in, in a faraway in a faraway land. And I think that that, that time, uh, going there to be a part of a U.S. mission to understand what had happened uh, and to help this country after it had been invaded was, was absolutely uh, amazing because they really wanted help. And you saw that what people would want to do uh, for, for freedom. So I think if each time as, as I've gone to these countries, it's made me appreciate our country. It's made me appreciate uh, our freedoms. And, and one thing that I, I do remember from that, that trip to Georgia was the president of Azerbaijan, who lived next to Russia, told us, he goes, you know, I really want to be closer to the U.S., but I cannot change geography. So come back to that point I told you earlier about understanding how people live and where they're coming from. Azerbaijan may want to be free and want to do certain things, but when you have a bad neighbor next to you, they're going to be forced to, unfortunately, not to, to do things they want to do because they have to think about their security uh, and, and those are your people. So other things happen, but I'm going to stop there because I know we need to get into the, uh, uh, into the question and answer session. Hopefully that was uh, good and uh, over to you. Thank you, Shep. What an incredible career that you've had and it, you've done so much and it's all been so different. And I'm sure we could talk for hours about everything that you have done and been involved in. But I did wanna give everyone on the call an opportunity to ask questions um, if you have any. So please feel free to put in questions into the Q&A or the chat and we'll be able to read those loud and get them answered for you. Um, I will kick it off uh, with a question myself actually. I was surprised, I guess, when you were talking about how many different experiences that you've had and how different all of those missions and uh, deployments were. And I was wondering, do you have, you know, after going through all of that and accomplishing all of that, what is the common theme to you that, you know, the red thread between everything that you guys do? Because everything is so, so wildly different, but it's all rooted probably in a, in a similar goal. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great question. You know, when I think about it, um, the common theme for, um, you know, you have to always be prepared. Uh, you have to train well um, in endurance. And if you're going to do well, you got to have a good team. You have to put aside uh, any differences. Uh, you have to work together. Uh, and I think ultimately when you're faced with a big project, big challenges, you come together and, uh, and you know, you, you can't not help but live with someone for months on end and, and not have some friction, okay? And it's just, it's just like any family. And we are the military, the family. Um, and the common themes where, you know, is work together, respect one another, um, be focused on the mission, but always be flexible. Because I can tell you there have been times uh, our mission was continually changing. And uh, we had to always be ready to adjust to, to the next challenge uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. Thank you. That's advice that I think works well for the military and other places in, in life as well. Um, someone in the group had a question. Um, you had quite a long career in the in the military, 31 years. How old were you when you started? Okay, so um, I started in junior ROTC in high school. I don't know if we had any junior ROTC students in, in the audience today. So that was kind of probably my first thing I did that in high school. Uh, I went to a military school, New Mexico Military Institute. And so I actually got commissioned at around 21 when I actually was, was commissioned. But my personal preparation started as, uh, back when I was a, a freshman in high school. So if you're saying I'm lucky on, I appreciate it. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. And then actually a follow-up question to that. Someone would like to know, is there anything that, you know, thinking back that you wish you might have concentrated on mo more while you were in school that might have helped you in your military career? Um, you know, I, I think obviously I'm a big history buff, so I think it's important 
uh, to understand not only our own history, but world history, because you'll be entering those environments. And having that understanding uh, really gives you an advantage when you go to understand and experience different cultures. I think the other thing I look back on um, is I wish that I always took advantage of every opportunity for leadership. Uh, if you're going to serve and you want to be a leader in anything, you need to take every opportunity uh, you can. And, and one thing that I didn't really start doing until later on is I, I like to read biographies. I like to read about leaders. You know, a, a military leader once said, if, if you want a solution to a new problem, read an old book. And I have found that to be true that as I look back and I read biographies, I see people who faced a lot of similar problems in work, relationships, otherwise, and it gave me a framework for which to succeed. And um, if you want to be the best uh, football player, find a biography on a football player. If you want to be the best baseball player, if you want to be next Supreme Court justice, you know, read about them, see how they lived and shaped their lives, and then try to replicate some of those experiences in your life to help prepare you for, for that event. Amazing. Thank you. So important. Um, another question that's come up. So now that you've retired, how do you remain involved in the military from a veteran and civilian standpoint? No, it's it's um, another good question. So, you know, I think for me, uh, I have been trying to be involved with groups like, I've been involved with groups like Honor Flight. Uh, I continue to help veterans on a number of American Legion posts. So I still want to be a voice uh, for veterans, but I think right now I want to give back more. Uh, I'm, I have a passion uh, for World War II and those veterans, and I want to just continue to help them. And at the end of the, the evening of their lives, I want to be able to just spend time with them and learn about their stories before they're gone. So I think just giving back and, and contributing where I can and, and wherever there's problems going on in, in my city, uh, try to get involved and, and, and be that representative. Take the skills I learned in the military and translate them in, into uh, community service. Fantastic. So just two more questions before we wrap up. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, the first is, is there anything that you want all of us and especially the, the young people on the call our students to understand about the military service? Oh, uh, great question. You know, I think as a veteran, okay. Uh, and um, one thing I didn't tell you, I had 65 years of continuous family service by my family in the military when I retired. So I, I had multiple members of my family in Vietnam. Um, we, we've had a long career as I've talked about in different uh, conflicts and so forth. And I think it's important for those of you in the audience today that if you have family members who serve, just please thank them. Whether you send them an email at night or give them a call to say, hey, thank you. Thank you for your service. Understand that if they're going to have a thing that happened in their lives uh, that were a part of history that you may not know about. Okay, you may find out that you had relatives at Pearl Harbor who fought in Korea, Vietnam, or who were in Afghanistan, Iraq. And it's just something they don't talk about. Why? Because they were just doing their job. And they weren't looking for glory medals. They were there to serve because that's what we're about. We're Americans. We're there to serve and, and to defend our country. When you do talk to veterans, there will be times when some veterans may not want to talk about it. It's painful. They've been through some very, very difficult experiences. And I was with a veteran from the Band of Brothers, a guy by the name of Babe Heffern, if you've watched that miniseries. And I traveled throughout Europe with him. And we were at a battlefield at Bastogne and he, he just started crying. And he went to a field and cried. And they asked me as the military guy to go talk to him. And these feelings were still very strong after 60 plus years. And so for some of these people, uh, be sensitive. They don't talk about that's fine, but thank them particularly those who served in Vietnam who didn't get a thanks on the way home, but also understand um, this is the best analogy. Uh, a Marine uh, was at the Army-Navy game a few years ago, and he had been through some of the most brutal battles in the Pacific. And someone asked him, Marine, why did you do this? And he goes, I did it so you could have this life. So our veterans have given something to you so you could have this life. And if you ever saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, uh, there's a letter that's being written that's being passed from each soldier. If one soldier dies, it gets passed to another soldier. And the ones who are alive continue to write it. You continue to write our story as Americans of freedom, and you, we must honor it, and we must remember it. It costs and, and, and cherish the freedom we have. And if they send a movie, earn it. So earn your freedom, folks. Give back to those around you. 
Thank you. That is super impactful and such a great reminder to everyone here. Last question before we wrap up. I know we're just a minute over and um, I think it's a great one to end on. What advice do you have for individuals or wisdom to share um, who are just starting out in their career and you know on the cusp of making these big life decisions? Anything that you'd like to leave them with um, you know, as they move forward? Well, uh, I think the most important thing is, is you're each going to chart your own course and you want to be prepared to chart that course. And when, whether you start in the military and other things, uh, invest in what you're doing, invest in the, the, the place where you live or, or where you work. Uh, and I found that in the military, what I used to do was I would volunteer for other assignments, even though it wasn't what my job was, it, it was something that needed to get done. And I tried to just become more and more um, uh, engaged and, and give them myself, even when it's something maybe I didn't want to do. Um, but I think that was important. And I found out later, my commanding officer said, listen, the reason you became, uh, you did so well at this command is because you kept getting involved elsewhere. Uh, and, and we need people to help. So think about that. Another thing is um, leaders, I believe, really are, are made through experiences. Um, you, you don't just show up the day you enter and go, you're a great leader. You learn. And you won't, and I would not be leader day if I didn't have some problems and some failures in the past, which I learned from. So when bad things happen, don't knock yourself out. Just remember that, use it, put in your toolkit, I'm gonna to do better next time, uh, and then move forward. And, and finally, the next thing is, is there's so much information out there. Uh, uh, you know, when you're, when you're an intelligence officer or you're doing work, you have to manage that information in order to understand it. But I want you to think about another thing you need to manage is manage yourself. Learn how to manage yourself. Where are your weaknesses? Are you a procrastinator? You know, are you, are you poor at writing? Or, or do you need better help in math? Work in those areas that you know and continue to work in those areas. Work in those areas that are weaknesses and, and they will become your strengths. Amazing. Thank you for that. Such incredible advice and perspective. And we appreciate you sharing and all of the, you know, um, service that you've done. Thank you so much for your time now, but also all of your time in the military. Happy Veterans Day. We're so grateful that you could be here with us and um, to spend this time with us. So thank you very much. I will pass it over to Darby to see if you guys anything to add before we wrap up. Yeah, Shep, this has just truly been an honor for all of us just to have some time with you today and hear your story. We are incredibly grateful for your service and a big thank you to everyone at home and at schools who have tuned in with us today to share in this, this memorable and inspiring experience. Looking ahead, we can't wait to connect more students from around the nation to meet veterans in person, Shep, just like you in Washington, D.C., to provide standing ovations that are so incredibly well-deserved. As veterans arrive in our nation's capital, our relationship with the Honor Flight Network is something that all of us at EF are immensely proud of, connecting the generations and allowing history to come alive in a most meaningful and important way. And that just speaks to the heart of education first. So as we close, please take just two minutes to answer the survey that will pop up um, we would love your feedback on this. Thank you to all. Happy Veterans Day. And Chef, that was incredible. So thank you for being with us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.